underway. Jordan, I'm going to hand it off to you to start our musical folks, and we'll go ahead and get going, everybody. Thanks, John. It's good to see you all. We're gathered here today to celebrate Gary Gertis, a beloved man. And uh, we're going to kick things off with one of his greatest loves, and that is music. So I'm going to invite Kim and Robert Case to kick it off uh, with I'll Fly Away. Somewhere morning when this life is over, I By the way, you guys can sing along, but you can't unmute. This is for Gary's sing sake. Sing it loud, sing it proud. We would want do us to do mute. this right. Yeah, because if you're not on mute, there's a syncopation problem. So, but join in, sing out. Somewhere when this life is over, I fly away to a on God's lesser shore. Kim, I want to welcome you all from all over the nation, from different par points and parts of Gary's life, and um, I have the honor of uh, leading today's service. Uh, my name is Jordan Taylor. I was a pastor in the Seattle area for my, well, not my entire life, but my entire pastoral life uh, until two years ago when I moved to Southern California. So I'm joining you all from down here and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, some of the sharings and I wanted to mention that um, at an appropriate time, uh, we'll open it up for those who would like to share. And so if you would like to share at that point, uh, we're gonna ask you to put your name in the comments so that uh, we can keep an order to it and different things. So I would like to begin 
today's uh, remembrings uh, by sharing uh, myself. I, uh, well, Gary's love of music is really what brought us together. Uh, Gary's love of music is well known. Uh, Gary loved music so much, uh, he didn't only desire to perform it, uh, he would teach others, and in particular students, and how to make music and even produce events so others could showcase their musical abilities. And it's that, this love of music, uh, is how Gary and I got to know each other. Um, I would load in and load out for various music events Gary was doing sound for, and this is some years ago now, uh, but you know, in particular, there are many summers where we would do the Camp Jitterbug Swing Dance event in Seattle. So, uh, you know, those are the things that brought us together. I, it's hard for me to uh, think of Gary's passion for music and not also think of uh, his unique sense of humor, uh, his easygoing nature, uh, one of the, the most easygoing people I've ever worked with, and very intelligent conversation. And something maybe uh, specific to me, part of the job that we did together, uh, Gary's unique and specific way of playing Tetris with the sound gear in the back of his Tacoma truck. So <laughs> there's a lot of memories and um, of some very good times in my life. And today I would like to share a bit about happy, the happy day of God's love and our love for God in response. And as you might expect with that, uh, I wanna reference the gospel hymn, Oh Happy Day. And it was a worldwide hit in the 60s, uh, but in fact, it was an arrange a rearrangement of a hymn from 1704 uh, called, Oh Happy Day That Fixed My Choice. That's not quite as catchy of a title as Oh Happy Day, but it, you should consider the original title of the hymn, which was Rejoicing in Our Covenant Engagement to God. So we've progressed a long way, uh, but the, the original hymn and the better known rearrangement we have today are based on a scripture, and that's what I'd like to reference in Second Chronicles 15, 15, which says that all in the region of Judah were happy about the covenant for they had entered into it with all their heart. They earnestly sought after God and they found him. And the Lord gave them rest from their enemies on every side. And I think Gary in particular would appreciate the previous verse, which says that they shouted out their covenant of loyalty to the Lord with trumpets blaring and horns sounding. And the, the people talk about this as the happy land. And, uh, you know, though I didn't ever see Gary's band Tomfoolery, I imagine there was trumpets blaring and horns sounding uh, at different points. But the happy day of God's love, it changes everything. And it, maybe it doesn't change things in the way you might expect, though. Um, my youngest daughter asked me recently who I love more, her or Jesus. And, you know, it's funny to think about the questions of a spirited five-year-old. Uh, but I responded to all three of my daughters who were all listening that the answer is not simple. You know, when I love you, I am also showing my love for Jesus, who shows me how to love as a father. So, yes, I love Jesus more uh, but my love for you and my love for whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, all of our love for what is good is bound up in our love for Jesus. And don't misunderstand me, loving Jesus is an exclusive love, a before anyone else love that does require us at times to selflessly sacrifice instead of serve ourselves. But that is because on that day, that moment, God selflessly sacrificed himself so we could experience that happy day. And both the scriptures and the songs, they celebrate a great transaction where God's love and God's action secu are secured on behalf of humanity. Oh, happy day when Jesus 
washed. He washed my sins away. That is the day, the moment, the act of God that shows God's love for humanity. That day, that moment, that act of God were and are important to Gary. That amazing grace of God changed everything for Gary. And again, maybe not in the way you might expect. And it showed him how the song goes, how to watch, fight, and pray. Now, I should maybe just admit real quietly here that I actually just learned today that the word fight is in there. I always thought it was watch and pray, but it's actually watch, fight, and pray. And I hope that these words that I'm sharing do not ignore or minimize the grief of loss that we all feel today. I hope that these words would simply acknowledge that Jesus's goodness encompasses and exceeds all loss. And may these words proclaim the hope that life, even lived with wounds, is yet full of meaning, fraught with wonder, bound by love, tenderly woven, and filled with hope. It's good to be with you all today. I'm going to ask John now to share with us. Hey, look, this is me unmuted. Can, can you guys see me? It hasn't switched. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. I can't see myself, but that's okay. Maybe, Jordan, if you put yourself on mute, it'll pick me up. All right, guys. So uh, did a lot of thinking about Gary these last couple of weeks. Uh, what comes to mind? The first thing that comes to mind when I think of Gary, oddly enough, is not music. I'm sorry. I know that that was at the center of his entire being. The first thing that comes to mind with Gary is a sly sense of humor. I distinctly remember sitting at the back of a room, some family event with Clifford Potter, myself, and Gary, listening to Gary and Clifford Potter uh, make puns, make jokes, make fun of, have weird observations. And I always felt like I was back of the bus with those two guys. I felt so good when I would land a snarky comment or a pun and that would make those guys laugh. Very, very, very quick wit. I think when I think of Gary, I think of a very big, big, big heart. Gary's love of people, Gary's love of, of <laughs> the world around him, children, uh, his love of God, his love of Jesus, his love of, of Anne, his love of Ian. Uh, he just had a very, very, very big heart. And uh, it was evident to me uh, in, in, in many, many, many ways. What a guy. I swear to God, Gary could make me laugh like nobody else could make me laugh. He, 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 the stuff he posted on Facebook, you know, the last couple of years, he couldn't get out and about as much as he liked to. But man, the only reason I logged into Facebook in the last two years was to see what random, crazy, goofy thing Gary had posted this time. You know, whether it be pumpkin spice flavored cheddar cheese dip. Uh, anyway, his that sort of sense of joy that he brought to the world around him is something that I, I hold dear to the heart. Um, his sense, his sense of whimsy and wonder in the world, punk rock to Pacini, flower child with a chainsaw. Gary was one of those alchemists, you know, musicians, the people who can make you feel stuff that you don't know that you're supposed to feel until they put a melody a certain way or write a bass line a certain way or make the lyrics sound a certain way. Musicians have magic, and Gary was a practitioner of that crazy, crazy magical art. Um, I just need to say I grew up on Tom Fuller. I met Gary when I was 11 years old. Gary and Ann were the, the coolest people, uh, uh, the hippest people with all the, the great stuff going on. And they had these big, crazy shows, and there was lights, and there was music, and there was inclusion. I felt a part of something when I went to a Tom Fullery show. Uh, I felt a part of something every time I ever did any music with Gary. Gary always made me feel like I belonged. 
uh, and that's quite a gift. He had a quiet center about him uh, when talking of hard things or easy things. Gary was a voice of solace and counsel to me over the years. And, and he'll be sorely missed for that. <laughs> Gary's a big reason why I love puns. I mean, come on, where are you been all my life? At Maxwell's house in the hills, brother. Uh, what do you guys do with them old batches of coffee? Demo batches? Why, Debbie toss out. Uh, he asked big, unknowable questions, like who took the Coke out of Coca-Cola? Uh, and I got to say that even after all these years, I'm still very, very sorry about Aaron Bortolazzo's and my decision to paint Jess Marion on the back of his car with house paint. <laughs> Apparently that wasn't what we were supposed to use. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, I wanna remind everybody to mute. I'm now going to read some selections of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is one of my favorite poems of all time. Gary even liked it, some of the lines at least but it is something that I read when folks go away. Um, shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers. Stretched on the floor here beside you and me, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force this moment to its crisis? Though I have seen them all and seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet and here is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant Lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the Prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use. Politic, cautious, meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Do, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed in seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. I will miss my dear friend, Gary Gerdes, and my life is richer to have known him. And I, I know that so many people feel that same way. So that's what I have for us today. Jordan, back to you. I want to remind folks on the call, y'all, anybody wiggle your mouse, lower left button, click that little mic thing, the mute button. Gina and some other folks. Jenna, I'm not sure who that was, but yeah. Cousin Jenna. Cousin Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Okay, I'm done talking. Back to Jordan. Mike, I'm going to mute. If Robert and Kim would lead us in another one of the great songs to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and 
and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through going to hear from Chris. Hi there. I'm, I'm Chris Berg. Uh, Gary and I, I've known him for 54 years. Uh, and today I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of the what Gary meant to me. I'm also, I see a couple of some other very good friends. I see Mr. Paul Ebensteiner. I see Mr. Paul Gothel. I see Mr. Doug Clybor. And uh, I think I saw Terry Watson just a little bit ago. But Paul uh, Ebensteiner and Paul Gothel and I, we have all known Gary for 54 years. And so our journey with him uh, has been over that course of time. And so right now, some of the things have already been spoken about Gary that uh, come to mind. And I think of Gary as, uh, as Paul Gothel said, a Renaissance man. He was an inventor. He was a lover of literature, especially mythology and poetry. Uh, he was a cook. Uh, I did have a chance to have barbecue with him on, on occasion. Uh, so in that capacity, I think he was more like a rabbi. Uh, I would call them burnt offerings, but they were really good. They were good, uh, you know, and I enjoyed being with, I enjoyed being with Gary uh, in those moments. Uh, he was, as everybody has said, he was witty, he was humorous, he was a notorious punster, and a shameless punster at that. He was a wacky wacketeer, and all the folks from uh, Tom Fullery will know that. Uh, he was a, a Spike Jones reincarnation, and a combination of kind of a Groucho Marx Woody Allen to me, and as has been mentioned too, he was, he was a teacher. So with that said, we're going to hop in the time machine. We're going back to 1967. And we're uh, Paul and Paul and me and Gary, we're all uh, sophomores in high school. And uh, Paul Ebensteiner and I, we had a little band uh, and we needed a keyboard player. And lo and behold, Gary stepped in and uh, Gary used to live down the street from Paul Gothel. And Gary was taking piano lessons from Miss Polly. So next thing I know, uh, Gary shows up. He's got a cool uh, Vox Jaguar uh, keyboard and, a, and an amplifier. So bada bing, 
uh, Joff, the rock band is formed and we add our drummer, uh, Steve Johnson. And here's our, our old calling card uh, from back then. Uh, Iceberg, Hurdy Gerdes, Hero Edmund Steiner and Butterfly Johnson. And uh, it says, uh, you name it, we play it and in parentheses, small print, uh, sometimes. Uh, we should have said, just said, show me the money. But we didn't think of that. Uh, anyway, so here we are, all sophomores, and uh, Gary and I are in the, the marching band, the concert band, the jazz band, and then we also uh, are in our rock band, and we discovered a mutual love for Spike Jones and music from the turn of the century, 20s and the 30s in particular, and 40s. So Gary, in his inventive way, decides, hey, let's have a duet. So we had a duo called the Fantastic Elastic Rubber Band Golden Review, Gary's name, uh, that he came up with. And we played pizza parlors and uh, uh, some private parties and anywhere we could. And in addition, um, we had, I don't know where this came from, but Gary decided we should have a German umpa band, uh, kind of a Oktoberfest uh, band. So I played trombone, he was clarinet, we had a trumpet, we had a tuba and we had a uh, saxophone. And as if that wasn't enough, I mean, all I think about is my sophomore, junior year, we were always rehearsing. We were playing someplace in our bands or we were rehearsing. And so it's frantic. And, but, you know, that wasn't enough. So in our senior year, uh, the Jesus uh, movement was very strong and powerful in California and coming through. And Paul Evansteiner had our bass player, he had formed a little group called the Light Company with three gals. And during the course of that senior year, we kind of merged with the rock band. So it was Gary and, and Steve and Paul and myself and the three gals. Uh, and so, I mean, I was rehearsing all the time. It was crazy. It was so much fun and we had a blast. And during that time, over those high school years, and then into the first year of uh, Gary at college at Santa Barbara, uh, we played uh, all over the place, but I, I really saw Gary develop in all those areas that I mentioned. He was the cartoonist. He had a little uh, thing that he drew called the Christmas Grinch. And it was this little dinosaur looking guy with two big teeth, but he would always have a big can of beer sitting right underneath him. And Gary would constantly be drawing all kinds of cartoons. And he was an inventor. He, was a, he loved literature uh, and witty and humorous teacher. But above all, I think Gary, as has been mentioned, I think he would say, uh, I want to be known as a musician. And in fact, in his book uh, that he wrote on songwriting called Songwriting, uh, Mystery, and Sweat, um, I got it here. So chapter zero, who else has chapter zero for crying out loud? So chapter zero at the top, he says, takes a line from a song from the Rolling Stones. It says, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and fame or wealth and taste. I'm sorry. Down the page, he says, for me, if just one person tells me that one of my songs met something, uh, made them think or provided them with some diversion from their concerns. That's all the victory I need. And then he says, of course, the wealth that Mr. Jagger mentioned above would be a tolerable side benefit. Okay, so <laughs> that's Gary. And so, so we, we had a wonderful time and that was the foundation of our relationship music, naturally. And so uh, later on, uh, Gary went to college. Uh, I went off to college. Paul, everybody went their ways. At one point, I had a break. I came down. I lived with Gary for five months in Isla Vista, right next to the campus. Uh, we had many adventures there. Uh, I learned a lot more about Gary. He did some dramatic readings of poetry that uh, I stick in my mind to this very day. Uh, we had some time to converse. That was one thing we uh, didn't share a lot of because it seemed like we were just always playing or rehearsing. 
but we had a friendship that was being constantly uh, fed and growing and growing. Uh, and so then uh, in 1974, he graduates, I graduate, I come back, I met a girl in Seattle and Karen and I get married in 1975. And I asked Gary if he would uh, put some music together for me. And so he did. And, and I've, I only came across this about a year ago. It's the original manuscript that Gary wrote for a recessional hymn for my wedding with Karen. And uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful and I love that I found this. It really is a precious treasure. Uh, and, and Gary was so gracious to, to do that for me. And we, we kept in touch and I moved to, we moved to, my wife and I moved to Seattle in 70, uh, 70, whatever it was. <laughs> anyway, we moved to Seattle and, and then Gary had the most intense time musically in his life. And that was with Tom Foolery. And uh, Gary had written, a, put together a scrapbook for their 25, 25 year anniversary. And I've got that scrapbook. And, and it's a beautiful scrapbook. And I've been spending time with it the last couple of weeks, as well as his songbook. And uh, part of that scrapbook, there are comments from all the band members, a lot of them. And in that uh, point of what John was saying, it was the most intense, very funny, a lot of energy. Gary and Anne were totally 100% involved in that project. And it showed. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky that Gary uh, actually transferred from tape uh, performance of the band. And so I've actually got a chance to see them uh, on, on a video, but never got a chance to see them in person. Uh, but I think that was think, uh, a crucible that really made Gary just drawn every reserve that he had. Uh, his, all of his, his uh, reading, he was also a carpenter doing carpentry work. It drew on that, he built, uh, they built sets, they built uh, uh, the bandstands, built and designed those, the speakers. So he, he brought every portion of uh, what was available to him to, to the project. And I wish I could have seen them live. <laughs> but they went through that beautiful project. And then about 1979, uh, Gary and I were still in touch. Uh, that was kind of coming to an end. And I told him, I said, hey, you ought to move up to Seattle. It's really great. The music scene is good. And uh, there's lots of opportunity up here. And besides that, Paul's up here and Paul is up here. <laughs> and, you know, you know, it's all good. Come on up. So that's what they did. They moved on up and uh, found a place in Ravenna. And, and from the get-go, boom, I was over there. Gary had a little loft studio, tiny little thing. It was no bigger than a shoebox. I mean, even the, uh, the cockroaches were hunched back up there. And, and I don't know, he got a piano up there. I don't know how he did it, but we would go up there and that's what we did. We played, we had a blast. And, uh, you know, Paul Evansteiner would join us, Paul Gothel would join us, all these folks. And Gary then hit a stride of writing that was incredible, he, all this original material. So we put together a nine piece band and we played uh, during the eighties. And of course up here in the eighties, uh, original material didn't get you very far, but we had a blast anyway. We played one gig one time to a huge place down in Seattle on a Thursday, a very rainy night, two couples. And we played our brains out that night, best show that we ever did. And the two couples stayed there all two hours and they gave us a tip. And I think it was said, keep your day jobs. But anyway, uh, no, he, uh, we had a blast. And so we have played, and I, there are so many bands that I have played with uh, Gary in, and a lot of them he had started. Uh, so he was always constantly, constantly moving and, and experimenting and doing stuff. Uh, and I am the fortunate, uh, son who got to be along for the ride. And it was a really wonderful ride. Uh, and 
some folks have shared some words that I'd like to share with you. One of the things uh, was from Paul Evansteiner, and I wanted to share this one thing that Paul said, and it really it struck me as ringing extraordinarily true for me. And that was, Paul said, when I play music with Gary, uh, I was a better player. I was more confident. I knew he had my back, even as far back as high school. And through our adult years, he always was the pro and I was the amateur and I always had fun. And that was Gary. Uh, every time you'd play with Gary, every time I was playing with him, I felt totally confident because I had somebody that was so, so great uh, as a musician. And uh, as was said, accommodating and charitable and just, I could blow notes and it was just like a jazz musician, he would work around it. And another good friend of mine and uh, Gary knew, uh, Brad Agenbrod wrote me a card uh, this last couple of weeks. And he used a quote from another good friend of ours who was a phenomenal musician named Jack Pearson. And I just wanna read a couple things. So Jack said, uh, it occurs to me uh, lately that uh, anyone doing music in any setting has just as much validity as the most acclaimed concert master in the most prestigious concert hall. It's all about being human, creative, and honest where you find yourself. That's all. I rather suspect that much great art happens in small places that don't attract much attention. It's happy just being what it is. And then Brad wrote, uh, there is a special bond between musicians. Uh, it is formed in the creative moments of making music and communicating connecting not with words, but with notes, rhyme and harmony, rhythm. It's mystical and it's a gift. And, and it is, as was mentioned before. And I'm so glad to have had that gift of Gary in my life. Uh, and a song that came to mind that we used to play quite frequently was called, I'm a Pilgrim. And the birds back in the 60s did a wonderful rendition of it. And we, we did the best we could. <laughs> but the first verse says, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger traveling through this wearisome land. I've got a home in yonder city, good Lord, and it's not made by hand. And another lyric that, that hit me this week was a song by a, uh, John Prine. And I think it was off his last album. It was called, When I Get to Heaven. And when I think of Gary, this first verse, uh, it, just, it just speaks to me. So here it is, and I hope I don't flub it. So John Prine wrote, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna shake God's hand. Thank him for more blessings than one man can stand. Then I'm gonna, get a guitar, and I'm gonna start a rock and roll band. Check into a swell hotel, ain't the afterlife grand. And right now, that's what I'm, I'm thinking in my mind of Gary. He's already in rehearsals. He's got the band together. They're getting ready for their first gig. And uh, he's carrying on. His music is, Gary was the music man, and uh, I, I love him. I miss him. I will miss him very much, but he is a fabric that is in, uh, completely sewn into my life as well as many of your lives, obviously. And uh, uh, I don't say goodbye to Gary. I say, Gary, I love you, and I'll just see you when I see you. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful uh, rehearsal. And I hope your first gig goes really well. And I'm sure it will, because it always was a blast to play with you and, and all our gigs were really fun. I love you. And I love Ann and Ian and John and all of you folks uh, that were part of Gary's life. Uh, I'm gonna miss him a bunch.
Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I wanted, at this point, I want to ask if you would like to share um, to drop a note in the comments and we want to open it up for those who have um, stories or things that they would like to share um, about Gary in this time, uh, have an opportunity to do so. So uh, take a moment, drop your name in the comments and um, we had one person who was ready to go, but I believe she is getting her second vaccination. So uh, <laughs> uh, we will wait for the next person. Okay, Lisa, uh, if you can unmute yourself uh, and share with us. Hello, hi, Anne, hi, Ian. Um, I wanted to share just how gracious and generous Gary was. He's a very generous person with his time, with his listening, but about a little over 10 years ago, I was leading junior high at City Calvary, and I'd known um, Gary and Ann from Fairview Christian School Days and going to City Calvary. I was like, we have a bunch of junior high kids. I think we should start a, a youth, a youth uh, worship team, but I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and I heard that Gary used to have these worship jams where people just come over and play music. So I called and said, do you think you could spend your whole summer helping us form a youth group band? So every Wednesday for 10 weeks in a row in the summer, Gary and Ann showed up at City Calvary and he had songs picked out in all the, um, I don't even know the words, um, organized so that 12 year olds through 16 year olds could all play together at whatever musical competency level skill they had. And we had the best time and Ann had planned that we would go down to the U district or not U district, U village where they had the summer concert series and one of their favorite bands. And so he just was so generous with these kids, patient. And by the end of the summer, they were playing some great music and started leading worship for our youth group. Um, but just his patience, you know, that he came prepared, met each kid where they were at. And it was so much more than music because we had some kids that summer going through some really, really hard stuff. And for two hours, they got to just escape the troubles of life with a guy who just was faithfully showing up, meeting them where they're at. And anyway, I'm thankful that he did that. And more than that, he, I took guitar lessons from him and I was horrible, but he was always very, very patient with me. And, you know, I left feeling so much better about myself. <laughs> at the end of that. So I'm just thankful to have known him and I will miss his Facebook post too because he lightened the load every day. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Terry, uh, you mentioned that you would like to share something. Can you unmute yourself and share? Hi, it says Linda Mickleberry because I'm at my sister's place, but I'm Terry Watson and um, yeah, I see some old friends here from way back. It's so nice to see people and Chris, it was so nice to hear what you had to share and um, I, yeah, I, um, I was involved in the worship jams with Gary and Ann and I don't even remember exactly how I met them but I just remember walking into their house and seeing all these amazing like miniatures that Ann had and then walking downstairs and here's this huge Lego village that uh, and it's like Anne was like oh that's Gary and Ian you know and I and then all these and then down into the wonderful basement that was all lit up with lights and instruments everywhere and I thought this 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 is a creative house it's just creativity flowing everywhere and um, yeah I just you know Gary was just he was like a Pied Piper I mean he just gathered people around him and um, you know I I just had so much fun you know we also I got involved and we did worship band at City Calvary for a while before I think they were we they thought we were a little too country after a certain point in time but um and and yeah Gary he kind of encouraged me I mean I, I found that his sense of humor kind of connected with some of this side of people don't always see of me that's kind of a goofy side because I my first record I ever owned was given to me by dad it was Spike Jones 
and um, and he loved Pogo, and I always loved that, you know, Friday the 13th is on a Wednesday this month, kind of, so he, you know, I, all these little odd things that it's like, yeah, I remember that, and, um, and Gary would just encourage us to grow as musicians, and I, I mean, when he, he kept trying to get me to sing a little more jazzy and a little more, you know, solo, and it's like, they got some music out of me that I never would have thought, you know, and I learned, I learned to play a really good egg with the group. And then um, later we formed um, a little country band called Barefoot Gospel with Chris. And uh, we did a few gigs with that where we could really be as country as we wanted to be, you know, so there was that side and then his rocker side. And, but basically at Worship Jam, I only just wanted to hear him sing Oh Happy Day at the end of the night. You know, I always wanted to hear him do his gravelly voice. I could listen to him play that and play that keyboard all night. And just, you know, he's such a kind, um, just wonderful, gentle, you know, you know, gruff exterior, heart of gold kind of guy. And I just um, will miss him. And Anne, I love you very much. And um, I just feel for you right now, but I, I'm praying for you and Ian. Thanks. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Kaylin, if you could unmute yourself. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I, I don't know a lot of you, uh, I think, but about uh, 15 years ago, my wife Jenny and I moved in across the street from Ann and Gary. Um, and I, I think as many have have shared, uh, you know, a lot of the common themes have resonated with me. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somewhere along the way, I think uh, Ann and Gary suggested that we should put together a, a neighborhood band uh, to play at our summer block party. And I, I think Gary named us the Blockheads. Um, and after a couple summers of, uh, of getting together a couple times to get the band ready for, uh, for playing that neighborhood uh, uh, gig, um, Gary and Ann suggested that we should just keep meeting year round, maybe get together once a month and play some music. Uh, so for a number of years now, we've had the opportunity to do that. I'm a drummer. Um, I play with all the skill of somebody who's spent the last uh, 15 years playing roughly once a month. Um, and Gary was incredibly gracious about that and uh, would even throw it my way for a solo every now and then. I never, uh, despite the fact that Gary was the consummate musician and, uh, and a professional, um, as, as has been described, I, I never felt uh, judged at all. And I always felt very comfortable playing with that group. It was, uh, it was a real highlight for me to be able to continue my music uh, with, with some of the opportunities that don't exist anymore. And then you'd get an op a chance to chat with Gary a little bit and um, he would go into the music theory of the songs that we were playing and talk about all the different versions that have been recorded over the years and which ones were his favorites and why. Um, and if we had a song we wanted to play, he'd just drop a score so we could all play it uh, the next time we got together. Um, and of course, his sense of humor resonated incredibly uh, with me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> just been a, a blast to be a part of his musical journey and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that and uh, for the opportunity it's given me to continue expressing my love of music uh, through uh, participation in that group so we'll, we'll miss Gary dearly yeah and my daughter Josie wants to say something here too I remember when I think I was seven mm -hmm. it was December and I got to come down to one of their um, practices and I got to play some Christmas music with the band and it was really fun. Yeah. And a, a family <laughs> joke ever since then has been, you know, Gary loved ending a song in a big way. Uh, he would really drag out an ending. And uh, so we played uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And there were probably three or four times when we thought the song was going to end. And then he would come back, everybody now, and we'd do another chorus. And so that's been a family joke ever since then. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Brett Weathers, uh, would, can you unmute? Thank you. I can. Yeah, so I had the privilege of working with Gary at Eastside Christian for 15 odd years. And I was another musician at the school, although as many of you have shared, I'm a very mediocre musician who benefited from working with somebody as skilled and, and gracious as Gary and was the sort of the school AV guy. And so I got to work with Gary a lot as he and support him with the, the band, did a few 
you know, helped him out with the, a few of his DJing gigs and such too. Um, and can really just speak to that, the gift that Gary had to, to encourage young musicians and take these middle school kids, various abilities, many of them total novices. And, you know, he'd, he'd write a piano part for them and, and put together a band and, you know, in a few months, the, you know, these kids are rocking away. And, um, so definitely left a leg legacy of worship leaders, band members, musicians, um, kids that were really influenced by, by his love and his abilities at, at Issa Christian. And for those of us who got to work with him a lot, uh, a whole that you know in our lives he'll be missed um and look looking forward to jamming with him in heaven thanks brett uh john in new york city thank you jordan um and thank you all for welcoming me um many of you i don't know but uh that doesn't really matter we all knew gary um in 1977, I grew up in New Jersey, and in 1977, I moved to Santa Barbara, California. And uh, shortly after that, um, I met Gary. Uh, he was one of a group of uh, a number of different young musicians who were all striving to, uh, to, to put things out there. Uh, it was a pretty uh, unique time in Santa Barbara. Um, and there were a lot of people doing interesting things. Um, I had a couple of bands, he had a couple of bands, people were playing around. And um, I had the very good fortune to be invited uh, because of scheduling conflicts, to be invited to be a guest guitarist with the Tom Foolery Show on more than a couple of occasions. And even though I was nowhere near the guitarist that Swing and Dave Collard was, the amazing Swing and Dave, um, that you'll hear on the recordings. Um, I was nowhere near that, that, that level of guitar player. I was still warmly welcomed and, uh, and appreciated for my own talents. And it really felt good. And I'll always cherish it. I'd like to share something that's very moving f for me and means a lot to me. Um, because of the internet, um, it's misattributed a, a lot. So I don't even really know where it came from. I've tried to track it down over the last couple of years. It's been uh, attributed to everybody from St. Francis to uh, Native Americans, to Sanskrit writings, to Tibetan uh, aphorisms. But be that as it may, uh, it, it doesn't lose anything. Uh, I think the sentiment is still genuine. And that is, when you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. Now, clearly, Gary Gertie's lived his life that way. And I offer my condolences to Anne and Ian and to all of you who cry along with me and who celebrate the spark and the joy and the energy that defined him. Thank you. My head and heart are with you. Thanks. Thank you, John. Lori. Hi, this is, my name is Lori. I'm Gary's younger sister by four and a half years. Um, the only way I can do this is to read, read it. So please forgive that kind of trite and stilted delivery. Uh, he was an attentive and protective brother. As an early photo of us shows him holding baby me on his lap. <laughs> I remember when we lived in New York and he would turn my bedroom into a magical circus with our numerous stipe animal collection as cast members. And he strung a high wire across the room for them to perform on. He taught me a secret language, which we would converse in, in front of our parents. I don't think they ever came to understand us, but it, they might have, and 
who knows? And anyways, we had fun. And again, with the gee, with the good, to the gawk, the geik, the gat, the gall, the, the goat, to the guy. And we would talk like that all the time. <laughs> Family time was great. Playing canasta, scrabble, board games. He was a ruthless uh, scrabble player. One time I beat him. I think that was all, only once. And he would always do the New York Times crossword puzzle. And I think he doubled up on doing it, feeling like his, you know, little vapid sister couldn't always win or, or couldn't win more than one time. And we would play Christmas carols around the piano, dad on drums, Gary on woodwind, me on piano. And then that was always fun. We would go water skiing in the summer. Gary would try to dump me by turning the boat at an opportune time. So I would have to hold on tight as the taut tow rope would whip me around. <laughs> in retaliation, I would stay up as long as I could. Sometimes 45 minutes and the water would get choppy, but I might be somewhat sore, but at least Gary wouldn't get another turn to ski. <laughs> We also went snow skiing with family and friends. We called Gary the mad bomber as he took delight in the straight line approach downhill, not doing much turning, <laughs> but he'd get more runs in that way. He arranged a wonderful trip to a four day Disneyland trip for Tara, Darian, my two daughters, myself, and him and Ian, when the kids were all at an age for maximum enjoyment. He, he got me a subscription to the Seattle Times newspaper with the plan that I would find work and housing and the girls and I would move. But I, I was excited by the idea, but decided we needed to stay in California. <clears throat> At 14, Gary introduced me to a musician by the name of Todd Rundgren. I was captivated for, with his music to, to the, the to no end. There's no other artist that ever really interests me over the last 40 years. I've been to maybe 20 of his concerts. I went to his birthday party. I, I went to a book signing in San Francisco where I presented Todd with two copies, one for me and one for Gary, which I asked him to write just one victory, which was, Gary's favorite song of his, and, and he mentioned it in his book as one of the songs he wished he'd written. I loved him so much. He was so funny, goofy, smart, and talented. I was almost so proud of him. I'm sorry, thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. There have been a couple comments in the chats. If you don't mind, I'd like to read them just so that we can all hear them. Uh, Jamie said that Gary reproduced his musical self in so many kids at Eastside Christian School. I know of several who are either on a worship team or in a band or both. Gary was a force for good in his love of music and people will continue to pay dividends. And Brett says, when Gary left uh, Eastside Christian School, he left some very big shoes, Chuck Taylors, of course. He will be missed by those of us who were blessed by him. At this point, I'd like to say a prayer that um, I've selected uh, from a book that's been meant a lot to me and my family over the years. Um, so if you would join me, the word of prayer and then uh, in conclusion after that Robert and Kim are going to play one last song. Let's pray. Now, oh God, please let eternal hopes in ever greater numbers begin to wing their way home to nest again in the sorrowed hollows of our souls to fill our memories, our tears, our days with their bright songs. 
May we learn, O oh Lord, how sorrow and hope were never enemies, but co-laborers. For it is sometimes the work of our grief to hew out deep cisterns where the sustaining waters of eternal hope might afterwards pool. May we submit our hearts to the work of sorrow so that in your hands, these hollowed spaces of love and pain and memory would become hallowed spaces, holy places over which your spirit hovers and broods crafting in us greater compassion and Christ-likeness and singing new hopes to life. Be nearer now, O Christ, than we have ever known. Be near to Anne, be near to Ian, be near to us who also share this grief. Comfort us, O God, in these hard and early hours of loss. Be to us a strength and light, for we are shocked and numbed as children spilled into cold seas, stunned amidst the sudden wreckage of our ship. Lead us through this sorrow. Teach our hearts to rest and to hope again in the goodness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. In the spirit of Gary Gertis, I'd like to rally everybody to sing along. But you have to mute. Even you, Jordan. Thank you. <laughs> Can yeah. I just add that, um, you know, I can't think of Gary without thinking of Anne. Her elegance juxtaposed with his sort of intellectual quirky grooviness and their genuine affection for each other and respect for each other and just sort of the way they enjoyed watching each other do their thing. And um, I'm just very deeply saddened for your loss, Anne and Ian. Love you. He was the coolest cat I've ever known. The cool cat. <laughs> Happy day, oh happy day, oh happy day, oh happy day, when Jesus was, when Jesus was, when Jesus was, when Jesus was, when he was, when Jesus was, my sins away, oh happy day.
Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to hand this over now to John uh, for anything uh, to follow up. Uh, so uh, I just put the the, uh, the, the the this is the event, y'all. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. And if anybody wants to talk more, I don't know, but I think we're I think we're probably done. I just want to thank everybody so much for making the space to fit this in today. And I know that this, uh, this event is not like a normal event when we could hug each other and caterwaul and make a bunch of music loudly in the house, which is what Gary would want. We can't do that, but we shared this together. And I just, I just wanna thank everybody so much. And um, I love to all, love to all, love to all. So, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh,